So let me introduce uh, today's panelists. Uh, we are joined today by two excellent subject matter experts that are very well versed in today's topic. Uh, Esther Niznanova, the head of our uh, diversity and inclusion practice. Uh, hello, Esther. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And um, Khalil Smith, our VP of Consulting and Research here at NLI. Hello, Khalil. Um, today's conversation will be facilitated, as always, by our co-founder and CEO, Dr. David Rock. And with that, David, I'm going to hand it over to you. Are you there? Thanks, Gabe. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sound great. I can see you well too. It's going to be more of kind of presenting the science today. I think we're going to hear more from Khalil who's going to facilitate more, I guess. Um, I've got some things to say, but I thought uh, we should start off with some context. Khalil, over to you. Yeah, thank you, David. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, want to get to, uh, as David said, a bit of the context around why we've come together. Um, we want to talk really deeply around how do we respond as a leader to the racial tragedies that we've all been exposed to and uh, many of us have known have been there for quite some time. Specifically, we want to really dig into finding ways to move forward. So what can we do to really harness the energy, to harness the awareness? Um, and we recognize for this conversation and for a lot of other things that people are all at very different places and that the collective emotions are strong and so we want to kind of honor that really appreciate that and figure out what we do with that speaking of those collective emotions david i would love to have you kind of talk a little bit about the three levels of threat which some folks may be a bit familiar with yeah we've been talking about these uh since early march when we first started doing these friday sessions and um it, it describes the threat response in a bit more kind of granular way in, in it, it turns out when we feel threatened, it's, it kind of comes in, in zones. There's a zone of alert, but not too alarmed. That's pretty functional. There's a zone of high alert, quite alarmed, which is level two threat, which is really dysfunctional actually for, for decision-making problem solving. Then there's the very highest alert, highest alarm, level three threat. And I know when kind of the, the, the COVID crisis started, we, everyone was waking up at level two, spiking to three. We've sort of all wrestled it back down and then Right now, the, the collective threat level is very, very high again. It's, you know, it's come really right up. So folks interested in that, uh, maybe my team can put some things in the chat, sort of things that we've written that you can dig into to understand that a little bit more. But just to honor and recognize that the collective threat right now is quite high. And I know people are you know, feeling a lot of things strongly. And it, it, it took some work for us to wrestle that down to think about you know, how to be productive as well. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last... Um, you know, a few weeks, um, this has been unfolding. Um, I think it's really only probably like later into this week that we've actually been able to say, how can we actually be um, useful as a, as a research institute? How can we actually be productive, useful, helpful here and, and finding a thread? And it was around basically how do we create positive change based on research uh, and trying to articulate essentially the most important habits. Um, trying to articulate the critical habits that really, really matter, that are relevant to everyone. So organizational leaders, CEO, all the way down to first time manager, uh, but also people just leading a family as well. So that's the context that we've been thinking from is how do we create um, some focus around the things that help the most? Yeah. And David, to your point, I know you and I wrestled with these ideas quite a bit, wrestled with the emotions quite a bit, and um, you really took the lead on, on kind of initiating some conversations around writing in this moment and being able to get things out that can continue to be helpful for folks above and beyond the work that we do in our consulting or our practices or our behavior change solutions. And um, this article that you have up on the slide right now, Leadership in This Moment, um, that posted to Forbes, I think it was just a couple of days ago now, um, that we really kind of finalize the ideas and pulled it together. And um, that'll really be kind of the, the foundation of this conversation that we're going to have today, because I think that we really got the three steps right. We're already starting to hear from a lot of our clients. I had a call yesterday uh, with an incredible chief diversity officer who called up and said, these are it. These are what we need right now in this moment. And so really looking forward to pulling these apart and hearing from you about kind of both the definitions and the science behind these. Um, and then also Esther, obviously from you, you've been talking with lots of chief diversity officers and are keeping an eye on our chat. Um, and just as a reminder for everyone in the chat, we wanna hear from you. We wanna know what you're experiencing, what you're seeing um, as we pull apart these three steps. We wanna know what your experience has been with them and what you're already starting to do in your organizations. Um, so let's actually start to unveil those three steps. Um, so the first is to listen deeply. 
we want to talk about what does it mean to listen deeply? What is the science behind it? What's, what's the practical application? Um, the second step is to unite widely. And the third step is to act boldly. And we want to really get down to what does bold mean? What, is, what does it mean in this moment? How is it different than the disruption or the transformation that we may have been through before? Um, so now's as good a time as any, without any further ado, to, to start to get into some of that. Um, and David, would love for you to maybe talk to folks about the definition and the science and kind of the blend of that. When you hear or when you were thinking of or when we were putting together Listen Deeply, what's contained in there? Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it came from work around um, how, do you, how do you deal with a very intense kind of literally level three threat response um, when, when, when you're trying to be productive? Like, what is the thing that can, can, can kind of um, bring people from a very strong um, away response, it's called, where, you're, you know, an anger is an away response, uh, as is a threat response. How, do, how can you turn that and, and turn that into something where people eventually are able to create real, you know, pr real positive change? And I want to just say the bold part at the end is important. It's not listen deeply to calm folks down and get back to work. It, it, it's yeah. listen deeply, unite widely, then act boldly. Yeah. Um, the, the, the listen deeply is, I, I guess from a definition perspective, it's, it's um, it listen so people feel more heard than they've ever felt before. Yeah. It's listen so people feel deeply, deep, deeply heard. I mean, Khalil, how would you how would you define it from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk. <clears throat> excuse me, talk about this a little bit in the article. It's it's listen to understand, right? We spend so much of our time listening to respond or listening to countermand something or listening to defend our position or pretending to listen because we've got a lot of other distractions and a meeting that we're getting ready to get to and other things that are you know, pulling away our attention. Um, and this listen deeply, and I think the deeply is so critically important here. It is about how do I remove the, the obstacles, remove the distractions, what Gabe talked about a little bit where he said, you know, shut down the other applications, put your phone away for a little while, really be in the moment. And when we think about doing that with others, there's so much value and you can tell the difference, whether you're on video or not, you can tell the difference between somebody who is really listening and somebody who is kind of listening, but probably doing something else. Um, so I think that that's, it's such an, an important thing, but the deeply is really the adjective that, that drives that listening. Yeah. I, I think, you know, as we look at this from an organizational context, I think I kind of see almost like concentric circles. So kind of at the outer rim of the circle is make sure every single person in your organization has an opportunity to share their voice um, in, in various ways. And some of that will need to be, you know, technology platforms, other things, if you've got 100,000 people, you know, so, but find ways for everyone to be able to have a voice, you know, closer in, you know, find ways that people can really be heard by their, you know, by their team, for example, that team conversations can happen, kind of going closer in. It's how do you as an individual leader, you know, really listen to your constituents, your, 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 your employees, also your customers also listen to, you know, what's really happening in the world. Um, and it's, it's a difficult thing to do, especially, um, you know, right now there's a lot of strong emotions for people. So it's really difficult to listen when you're feeling anxious. Um, it, 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 you know, your own threat response as a leader can shut down your ability to listen, um, which is really, uh, you know, a, re a real challenge. Esther, do you want to add something to the definition just before we get into the, the science a little bit more? Anything that you would say is sort of an kind of defining listen deeply? What, what do we mean by that? Um, I fully agree with you. And that goes back to how do we allow those conversations and also how do we um, share that sometimes those conversations are going to be clumsy and uncomfortable. Um, and it's okay to have those too. Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely going to be uncomfortable uh, for a lot of people. Uh, and also just listening to someone who has strong emotions is uncomfortable. You know, and listening to people with very strong emotions uh, can, you know, can create you having strong emotions and it, suddenly you can start a, a cycle. And so one of the one of the things I think is really important for leaders is to go into these, you know, listening opportunities uh, from a very calm place. Um, I think it's really important to manage your threat level as a leader and go in from the lowest threat level yourself. Um, I've said as half a joke for a long time, you know, in an, in an emergency, get mindful. <laughs> Um, 
And by that, I don't mean sit in a cave for a while, but take a mindful moment. And, you know, what does that mean? It means uh, putting your attention onto incoming data in the moment, um, putting your, activating what's called your direct experience network in the brain. It could be through some deep breaths. It could be through just your know, feeling of your feet on the floor. It could be something you eat, but, but some kind of data stream um, is necessary. And you put all your attention on that for a moment, uh, really focus on the incoming data in the present. It gives you that mindful moment and it significantly calms down uh, the overall limbic system. So, you know, one thing from the science perspective for listening deeply is, you know, you as the listener have to actually be in a low threat state um, or you, you just physically can't do it. And that that's going to take some intentionality um, for, for a lot of people. So that's one, one piece of it. I, I think another piece of it, maybe Khalil, you can add to this, but I, I think another piece of it is, we have a tremendous number of biases um, that are just built in. Um, we say a lot, if you, know, if you have a brain, you have bias. That's one of our mantras. Um, and, and, and it's very difficult uh, to mitigate those biases. In fact, um, many of the biases we have, and we organize them into to five categories, but many of them actually can't be mitigated or reduced with effort. But one of the most pervasive challenging biases is called experience bias. Um, and that bias actually can be mitigated by really hearing diverse perspectives. Um, and in fact, it's the only way of mitigating it is to really do what's called perspective taking yep. and really, you know, sit in someone else's world um, and, and, and ha you know, be able to see things from their world. It's, it's very effortful. It doesn't happen without a lot of intentionality. We've, we're just publishing a paper on that actually on perspective taking itself, but you, 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 you know, we've got to break through our own biases. And the only way to do that is actually hearing multiple perspectives um, in many ways. Khalil, do you want to address that a little further? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you're reading my mind because the perspective taking paper that we all just finalized absolutely jumped out at me. And I think one of the things that is so relevant about this moment is that um, sometimes for people that are less kind of familiar with biases, we don't recognize that those biases are more prone um, or we are more prone to them when we're tired, hungry, stressed, angry, frustrated. Um, and I know a lot of people that are experiencing any or all of those emotions. And so, um, you know, at the times where we need to be thinking sometimes our clearest and mitigating those biases and really reaching out to others, um, we're also contending with this very relevant, very kind of biological, you know, um, uh, block that gets in the way. And we have to be, to your point, mindful. We have to put the extra energy in to listen deeply. Um, and that's the thing is that, you know, I, uh, when I think about touch bases and obviously, you know, over the past week or so, I've had lots and lots of amazing conversations with different leaders, both inside our organization and without and, and outside. Um, so to really listen, to really be in the moment um, is a bit draining, right? To shut everything else out and to just be there with that person for a period of time. Um, and for a lot of us, it can be really enriching, but the science does absolutely reinforce that you have to do it well, you have to really focus in, because if not, it can be just, you know, overwhelming and unproductive. And yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. And I think, you know, I think it's sort of both sides of the equation, right? So the person listening and the person being listened to, right? The person listening um, you've got to calm your own brain. You've got to, you know, really work hard to listen, to mitigate your, your, the biases you might have and, and, and be asking, you know, like clarifying questions to really get into that person's world. Um, and the idea is, you know, for the person listening is that you actually can fully grasp someone else's experience and fully have that person feel heard. Um, now on the other side, you know, the experience of being fully heard is one of the few things that really calms a nervous system, uh, a kind of fractured mind. Um, I mean, it's, it's literally what an FBI trainer is, or FBI hostage negotiator is taught to do, um, is listen to people in a way they've never been, you know, listened to before. Uh, and then you're able to have a conversation. And I think the goal here is a conversation. And while people are on many sides of the fence of how much, you know, anger should be expressed, I think we want to turn this into a moment where real change happens, uh, where organizations do act boldly. And I think, that's, that's going to require bringing people to a table and, you know, uniting people. Um, so it's kind of both sides uh, of, of this are really important. Yeah. 
Esther, um, I'm curious to hear from you, because again, to, to this idea of listening deeply, you've been doing that with a lot of chief diversity officers. You've been having a lot of conversations, even before some of the more recent events, because um, these are not brand new, and we see that some of that in the chat. Um, but what are you hearing, both honestly in the chat and from the chief diversity officers that you have been chatting with? What does listen deeply mean to them? Thank you, Khalil. Um, so, and the chat repeats exactly what I'm hearing from chief university officers as to how important it is to actually clear the schedules and just open the doors to truly listen. And it's been very humbling for a lot of leaders that I've been talking to in realizing that the conversations that are having right now are actually much deeper and much more substantial than the conversations they've had with the leaders over past two years, five years. And they're just asking themselves the question as to like what happened to us that we didn't have those conversations earlier and how can we learn from it and how can we really create a culture um, to be more human and to ha always have space to have those deep conversations. Another part, um, that back to what David shared around the levels of impact and listening to everybody is actually launching the listening tools for the whole organization and being able to have uncomfortable conversations within. Um, back to the chat, um, Anna shared that she's been surprised and shocked at how she wasn't tuned in to um, all that um, others were experiencing in their daily lives. Um, and Dalf shared that their CEO is actually holding listening sessions for employees to be able to share their experiences so that they can really work towards being part of the solution and not the problem. Mm -hmm. And that part of the solution and how do we actually open up um, to deeper conversations to drive for solutions um, is a big trend right now as well. Wow. Can I just, just a comment, I think, going back to just something in the chat and then I'd love to hear um, from folks in a minute about how your organizations have been listening. Like, let's hear some of the success stories. As you, sort of maybe folks on the line can think about the success stories that you've had just around listening um, and kind of what you've done. But, you know, one thing that comes up is um, definitely the, you know, the mental state. Um, the, men the mental state that people are in is, you know, is difficult uh, for all leaders. It's something we've been, we've been, um, working on for a while, uh, I think someone just posted something about this sort of the, the three, you know, cognitive pitfalls in a crisis that we published maybe a month back. Um, and it's really tempting for leaders to kind of forget about themselves and not take care of themselves or just kind of run on empty. That's going to be a problem right now. Um, you actually going to have to take care of yourself better than ever with your sleep, your exercise, all these things to have some calm. Um, it's also really easy to just kind of drive people and forget about the you know, emotions that they have and for leaders now, that's going to be very bad. Uh, you've got to like look after each other now better than ever. And then the third is, you know, the tendency to try to do everything. Actually, you've just got to focus on what matters now. Um, and those three habits became kind of a mantra of some work we've been doing. You know, take care of yourself, look after each other, deliver what matters. Um, and right now, I think the skills for focus, you know, for staying focused are more important than ever. Um, the, the skills of kind of your own buffers and then sending the right signals. Um, are, are really, really key. So let's hear from some of you. Maybe, Esther, you can kind of pull some of these in from folks in the chat. Uh, what are some of the things that you've been doing in your organization to, to really allow listening to happen? Um, do you want to share some of those, uh, Esther? It's interesting, David, that there, um, it is not much about solutions in the chat right now. It is a lot of questions around how to actually listen deeply. And the first part around it is, how do I listen deeply if I actually am experiencing the same? And another part is, but how do I really listen? Not to just what, what was said, but what is unsaid too. Curious what comes up for um, you and Khalil in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can take the first part of that, you know, around how to listen deeply when you're experiencing the same, because I have been very fortunate to have a number of people that have reached out and said, hey, I'd love to have a conversation. Um, and I'm having those same conversations with my family and my boys and my friends and my family and all of that. Um, and I, I think it does come back to what David talked about before, which is um, clearing the space, recognizing that we are not superhuman, any of us. And so we need to give ourselves a bit of grace. Um, I 
I've also spoken with, you know, other black leaders that have said, you know, I love that everybody is reaching out to me. I'm going to have to put some of those to the side for a little while because other people want to have this conversation right now. A, I need to take care of myself and B, this isn't a brand new conversation for me. And so while I get that it's a heightened level of awareness for you and I love that and I love that you're engaged, I, I need to take care of myself because I've got 126 text messages or 215 emails from people saying, hey, I really want to talk. Are you okay? Can we, can we chat? And so I think that listening deeply is a bit of self-care. It is what you described where we kind of, you know, say you have to put the mask on yourself first, like in an airplane before you can put it on others. Um, and I think that that's really important. And yet for many, and I saw a couple of folks in the chat who were saying the listening is actually a part of the processing for them. It's a, it's a part of the way that they get connected to others and build that relatedness and build that connection. And so depending on kind of what your natural orientation is, you've got to do the thing that is right for you. If that energizes you, then lean into that. If it drains you, then make sure that you're making the time for yourself. Yes, yeah. and I love what Erica shared uh, just now that they're focusing a lot more on learn and listen rather than listen and learn. Um, so taking that shift. Um, there's also a lot of conversation around that sentiment surveys don't really work, but rather you need to open the doors to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and also inclusion circles um, have been working very well in two organizations. Nice. Yeah, thanks everyone for your comments on the chat there. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do a summary of this and, and, and share that out in, in a bunch of forms in the next couple of weeks of just kind of what companies are doing and what seems to work. Definitely seeing some themes. Um, I think the big thing here is you have to start with this, don't end with this. Yep. <laughs> um, you, let's get to step two and three, but you have to start with this and have people feel more heard than they've ever felt. And for you as the listener to actually listen more deeply than you've ever listened. Um, so that yeah. we can move to the next step. Khalil, anything you want to add before we, we go on? No, I was going to say, I think we could spend a lot of time here, but as you said, there are multiple steps. And I think that's a critically important thing that uniting widely is the next step. And if we just stop it listening deeply, that's where we, you know, people feel like I've said this before, I've talked about it before. So would love to kind of have you give us a bit of a definition around what does it mean to unite widely and, and what is some of the science around how to do that? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really like a little hesitant and anxious about kind of some of the science because I, I don't want to be like misinterpreted or taken out of context and some of it's, you know, uh, potentially contentious. But look, we, we need for, for solutions to happen. Um, we're going to need people to feel like they're um, kind of on the same team. And there's a deep process that happens in the brain as any human interacts with any other human. Um, and, and, and that process is basically a fairly binary categorization, although it's, a, it's, a, it's on a continuum, can be further, but and it's basically technically known as in-group or out-group. Um, and, and, and the science of this is kind of scary. Like when you, we, we do this with every human we interact with, we classify them as in-group or out-group automatically, unconsciously. Um, and it has a huge impact on what happens next. Um, generally we go off kind of surface appearance. If someone, you know, sort of out group is the default, right? So we'll tend to assume someone is different to us, which is out group, right? Um, which by the way, means they have competing goals to us. We kind of put those together. So we'll assume people are out group, uh, kind of until proven otherwise. It's just, it's just safer that way. And people who are really different to us, we might put even further down the continuum of, you know, very out group. Um, so, so we have this automatic classification of, um, of you know, in-group or out-group. And what's really surprising is just how much of an impact this has on everything that, 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 that we then do, right? So basically, um, when someone is an out-group member, you process any information from them in a very shallow way. Um, it's kind of the, the it, it's very lightly processed, whereas any information, independent of what that information is, any, any information from an in-group member, you actually process very similarly to thinking your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jason Mitchell from Harvard did a whole neuro study on this uh, fMRI study, looking at different networks activated with people who are similar or different. And, you know, just on the basis of someone feeling similar to you, you literally, it's like talking to yourself compared to someone else where who's different. It's like very shallow, right? Very shallow processing. So uh, even physical movement of, someone who's in group or out group is processed differently. 
Um, so everything about perception is processed differently based on in-group and out-group. Um, secondly, uh, we have very little empathy, uh, automatic empathy for people who are in our out-group. We have to like really work hard, whereas people in our in-group, we have very strong automatic empathy. We like our pain network lights up when they experience pain automatically, whereas it doesn't happen for our group members, right? Um, and that has all sorts of implications. Like it makes us feel capable of, you know, doing really bad things to people that we think have competing goals to us and not imagining their pain, right? Um, and then the third one is motivations. And it turns out we, we're actually motivated to see in-group members win and succeed. So we have all these sort of non-conscious facial cues and choice of words and tone. And, you know, when we're dealing with an in-group member, we're like encouraging when they're telling positive stories and concerned when they're telling negative stories. But our group members, it's reversed. When an out group member tells us a positive story, we're like, hmm. And, and without even knowing it, we send these subtle things. So perception, everything's different. Empathy, everything's different. Motivation, everything's different. Just based on in-group or out-group. And that's kind of the bad news. The good news is it turns out to be relatively easy to create in-group. And the, the critical thing is shared goals. And, and what we've got to do here, and this is why, you know, Unite Widely is the frame here, is we've got to find some shared goals with many constituents. If you run a whole organization, it's the whole organization, really, um, and maybe your stakeholders, but, you know, in a team, with your family, with everyone. So until we actually unite around shared goals, um, we're in group and out group, and it's a problem. Because anything you say in that context is 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 rough. Clearly, anything you want to add there, or just bring some, some some shape and texture to that. Yeah, no, I, I think your your point around some of the the challenges of articulating this really um, in a really nuanced way are clear. Because what we don't want to fall into is the the both sides argument, right? That like every point of view is equally relevant. Um, because and from my own humble opinion, they're not necessarily, and we need to have those conversations. Um, but I know, you know, we've done some incredible work, and uh, Jay Van Babel uh, over at NYU has done some work around kind of this idea of minimum group paradigm, right? That, that it doesn't take a lot to bring people together, that you can, you know, use these shared goals as you're describing to bring people together, and that the value of that in group is substantial in how we work. And so, you know, we um, do a lot of work with governments and other places. The majority of the work we do is with businesses and as we've talked with people around as you framed at the beginning how to be great leaders this value of understanding that when we create those shared goals when we all say this is something that we want to accomplish that is bigger than me individually and it requires us to come together in order to accomplish it that is a powerful way to say well you might have been over there before you might have been over there before we might have had slightly different perspectives and yet now we can come together and actually appreciate our differences because those differences are a mechanism for us getting closer closer to that shared goal versus yeah. a way that separates us or differentiates us. Yeah, no, it's, it's important. I, I want to say a little more about the science. I'm seeing some good questions come in. We've written a lot about this and in-group, out-group is a deeply studied phenomena. Uh, there's hundreds, if not thousands of studies on this phenomena and, and different aspects. One of our, our, our uh, key scientists, Jay Van Babel, we work with a lot, uh, has, has published on this with us in, in, in our team's research, our inclusion research. Uh, we've done a lot. So our, our team can put some, some of the articles on inclusion in the chat, perhaps. Um, but it's, it's a very, very, very deeply studied phenomenon. It has all sorts of kind of quirks. But one of the things we published on um, was the sort of challenges of difference focus. And this is a really contentious thing. And maybe you can tell me not to go there. But it's the, the, we, we need everyone on the same goal. And while there are obviously differences to celebrate and, you know, every human is incredibly different, different races have incredible strengths. And, you know, it's what we've got to do is bring everyone together. Because in our inclusion strategies, when we focus on kind of celebrating individual audiences, we accidentally create out, out group for others. Um, and so in our inclusion work, we're, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're talking about actively including um, everyone so that we're, we're uniting widely. Um, I think that's, that's a critical, a critical piece of it. Yeah, indeed. Esther, I'm, I'm curious to hear again, to kind of the voice of our CDOs out there and, and the practitioners that are doing this work and also what you're seeing in the chat. What's coming up for you? Yeah, so there's a lot of activity in the chat, a lot around trying to understand deeper how they can proactively include everybody and what are some of the tools and techniques to be proactively including and removing the in and out group. So I think that we can address that first. 
yeah, yeah, there's lots of good stories. I mean, let's let's hear some of um, before you get the story. I mean, let's hear a little bit more of the science, I guess. Um, and, and I think if you're a corporate member, I know a lot of you are. I can see that in the chat. Uh, there's some fantastic resources. The inclusion paper, uh, the neuroscience of inclusion is really important. The um, take the focus off difference is a really important mm -hmm. paper. Um, there's three or four, there's also some powerful webinars and um, summit sessions that we've run over the years, like really digging into this. Um, I think that the positive thing, I'll come to you in a second, I think the, the positive thing is it doesn't take much to create in-group, even between people who are very, very different. Um, is that you can have people of different age, different race, different nationality, different background, different training, everything, and actually creates quite strong in-group if you find something they both want to achieve together. Uh, the brain starts to tag everyone as like having similar things to achieve and you start to literally create a connection with that person of, you know, we're on the same team. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite an easy thing to create in group if you focus on tangible kind of immediate actions that you, you know, that matter to both of you. Khalil, back to you. I was just going to say, David, I, I don't remember um, if we have a slide for it, but it might be valuable. I know to your point, not quite a few folks that are on are corporate members or might be more familiar with what we do. Um, but I, I can't get over the idea that SCARF is such a valuable tool in this conversation. Um, I know I talk about it constantly. I think about it constantly. I share it with, you know, clients and non-clients and family members in terms of really understanding what are those domains of inclusion? How do I unite widely? How do I make sure that people know that I care about them and that they are a part of this experience? Because I think in so many ways, you know, even I, I saw a couple of comments that like in group and out group, maybe either a new language for folks or they're just kind of figuring it out. And, and there's always this question of, so how do I do that? What am I supposed to do with that? What, what are the actual mechanics of it? Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about SCARF and, and give people just kind of the, the high level view of what SCARF is and, and why it's valuable and why we've doubled sure. and tripled and quadrupled down on it. It, it just keeps coming up. It's, it, it's uh, you know, with COVID and then now with this, it's just such an important frame. I didn't kind of prepare it. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, um, see if I can find it. Uh, there we go. No, nope, that seeds. There we go. So... SCARF describes, the SCARF model describes the five strong threats that the brain's tracking all the time. Um, each one of these, when they're a threat, activates uh, very similar to the, the, the pain center in the brain. Um, what's been really powerful or, or unfortunate, I should say, about the you know, COVID crisis is the huge drop in certainty and autonomy and relatedness um, all at once, right? The, the CAR. And then this crisis, you know, if you're a person of color, you're, you're all five of these are um, in, in, in the threat state in a, in a very big way. And in particular, the, the event that really kind of sparked the, the, the intense experience of the last week or so was, you know, very hard to understand. It felt like very unfair. Um, it uh, is very hard to rationalize that, you know, the, 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 the specific situation that happened, understand it. So it kind of had a very big fairness driver that you just couldn't get out of your head. Um, and so all five of these are in a threat state for many, many people right now, uh, but particularly people of color. And it's a, it becomes a, um, it becomes an emotion that feels kind of, uh, uncontrollable, uh, threat or uncontrollable stress. Um, and the trouble with that kind of threat response, when it feels like you have no control, it's out of control, you kind of do just about anything to, to get it under control. Um, and there's a, there's a, 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 a it's, it's challenging. And so this is partially what's going on and you know, many other factors, but SCARF describes the five things that are, are causing threat, but also describes the five things you can create rewards in. And the big one right now is the R is relatedness. And that is literally shared goals. So relatedness comes from shared goals, um, but also comes from you know, uh, creating positives in these other ones as well. Um, wow. Esther, I'd love to hear from you about the, 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 the things people are doing to Unite Widely. Um, let's go back to that. Yes, the biggest part, um, what you shared, Khalil, is actually uh, for a lot of our clients is using the SCAR framework um, in order to identify how to move forward and how to include everybody. The second um, big one that's coming up is allyship and launching allyship programs. 
Um, and the third one is using your existing diversity and inclusion uh, resources like the employee resource groups, business resource groups, um, in order to identify what can be done to unite widely. So no, ju not just assume that you can do something, but rather listen to what um, different groups need in order to create that common identity and common um, inclusion as a result of it. Right. Uh, Khalil, could you speak to the allyship work a little bit? I know we just did that for a huge organization. We, we built and rolled out some allyship work that was yeah. that being really powerful. Can you speak to that? Yeah, we absolutely have. So, and, and we've continued to explore kind of what allyship is and where it fits in. And, and the only other thing I was going to say specifically before I get to that um, is this idea that Esther, when you talk about the organizations that are now including their employee resource groups and saying, what can we do? There's a reason that these are steps, right? There's a reason that these are sequential because we can't start to unite widely until we've listened deeply, until we truly understand what it is that we're trying to solve for. And so David, to your point, a lot of organizations that are a bit further along in terms of maturity or in terms of kind of um, their experiences are starting to ask the question of what is it like to be a non-black person, a non-person of color, a non-woman, whatever the case is, um, and support people in an organization to recognize that there are institutional and systemic asymmetries, that there are things that are not fair, that um, are not necessarily the fault of any particular individual, but this kind of accumulation of a lot of different things that have happened over an extended period of time. And so the work that we've done with that particular client that you were talking about is about helping them to understand how do we talk about allyship? How do we build the right habits? Um, how do we ensure that this doesn't feel like um, or start to unintentionally become people swooping in and saying, hey, everyone, I'm here to help. And now everything is going to be solved. And I think that's why, again, doubling down on this listen deeply is if I, un if I ask the question of what is it that you need? How can I help? How can I support? As opposed to just trying to come in and accomplish things, um, there is an immense amount of value. And sometimes the answer is, I don't need anything right now. And sometimes the answer is, here's where I need your support. Here's where I need your guidance. And so that work has been you know, just really about with that particular client, but we're continuing to explore, how do you do it right? continuing to kind of pull in the research and, you know, SCARF, um, which I saw so many people talking about in the chat, was a couple of years in the making to really get it right, because we know that when we get it right, when we identify one of those models, it helps to explain so much of what's going on, yeah. we can have fundamental change. I, I want to address that because I was just having some insights as you were speaking there. And firstly, let me just get this out of my queue. Uh, people interested in allyship, we, we actually can help you with that. Potentially, we've, we've built a framework. Just put allyship uh, in the chat and someone will reach out if you just put the word you know interested in allyship or something someone will reach out and share some resources and, and see if we can help you in some way with that just put allyship or interest in allyship in the chat thanks folks um I, you know i was just thinking about this you know and the power of scarf and also uh, the the seeds framework and you know we, for years we've been calling this um disruptive language um and dis disruptive language is language that you don't like have to like work hard to remember. Um, it's, it's language that like literally pops up in the middle of a conversation and you go, Oh, that sounds like a status threat that I'm about to say. Right. Or so disruptive language actually lives in your unconscious. And then when a relevant situation pops up, actually the language comes to you and is helpful. And this is one of the things I think is super important, whether it's SCARF or some other framework. Um, you, you, you want something that people use constantly. Um, you know, it's, it's all very well to say, um, you know, we need to mitigate bias. We need to, you know, be aware of bias. But, you know, how many times a week do people actually do that now? Um, and that correlates to literally how disruptive some language is, which correlates to how sticky it is. Um, and, and relevant. And that's something that we've been trying to do is kind of develop disruptive language that people literally use many times a week, yeah. um, not just kind of a, a model there. We should yeah. get to number three. Um, that's what I was going to say. Disruptive is a, a, a great transition into some right. of this. And um, I know a number of people, myself included, have said, okay, well, we've been in this moment before, right? We've been here where we saw a video, experienced a thing, and there was outrage. And then that 
went down um, and we maybe didn't make the changes that we wanted to, or not maybe, we absolutely didn't make the changes that we wanted to. And so I would love to, for you to, to kind of weigh in on when we were talking about act boldly, um, that term was one that we anchored on and we said boldly, like that's what it is. It's not act now, it's not act, it is act boldly. So what does that mean to you? And, and maybe, you know, I know there may not be as much science around this because it's more about kind of the getting things done, but I um, would love to know what are some of the recommendations or what's the science that you would equip our listeners with? Well, firstly, I mean, look, the, the, the thing to be aware of is expectations, right? If you create some expectation of something big and then do something small, you're going to have maybe more anger than, 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 than good. Yeah. Right. So expectations that are um, met is not much of a reward response, right? If you, if you sort of say, I'm going to, Hey, I'm going to do five things. You do five. The brain goes, Oh, that was nice. If you say, I'm going to do five things and you do 10, it's like, wow, unexpected, you know, unexpected rewards are very strong. But if you say, I'm going to do five and you do four, especially when things are heated, actually that might be as big a drop as the getting to 10 is, right? Positive, because negative is much stronger than positive overall. And so right now, what you don't want to do is create like an expectation of doing big things and then, you know, do something small. Um, that's one perspective to keep into, you know, in, in mind. The second thing is, um, and we'll, we'll come to this in a couple of minutes is that you want to be thinking about both the, you know, the, the, the prior, you know, making this a priority, but also thinking about the habits and also thinking systemically. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. So you don't just want to be saying, okay, we're going to make this important. Actually, what we're going to do is, you know, really get serious about the, uh, you know, the hard work in terms of everyday habits that need to change and the systems that need to change. So I think, um, you know, from there, it's like, what can your organization truly do that maybe other organizations can't? Uh, that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. Like at NLI, we were thinking, you know, what can we do that's our contribution um, that, that, you know, would be hard for other people to do. Um, and, and that's what I kind of want to challenge you to think about. Great to give money to causes. If you've got, you know, cash flow and you've got funds and your organization can do that. Fantastic. But I, 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 there's an and, which is, you know, what's the unique thing that maybe you can do? as well that other organizations can't that impact your constituents your community um back back to you clearly Esther. yeah yeah and esther i'll come to you in a moment because we'd love for you to kind of share some of what you're hearing from folks i know the moment is still fresh and so um you know when we think about listen deeply and unite widely that's what a lot of organizations are focused on right now but i know that you've also spoken to some folks that are already starting to think about how to act boldly and if i go back to a little bit of kind of what i think of when i think of act boldly um david to your point both it is what are the unique things that you can do because not everyone has a significant you know pile of cash that they can donate or, you know, has a platform where they feel like they can reach millions and millions of people. But there are unique things that every organization can do that say this is critically important to us. And, you know, no big change has ever happened in an announcement. It might be started in an announcement, but the hard work that goes on beyond that is where the true disruption comes in. And so if it doesn't scare you a little bit, I wonder, is it truly bold? Right. If there's not something where people would, to your point, David, around unexpected, is it like, oh my gosh, wow, that I, I'm surprised that we're willing to do that. I, that we've never gone there before. We've never done that thing before. Um, because if it's not that, then you know, it's not necessarily bold. And I think one of the things that will be interesting for organizations, and I saw a little bit of this in the chat, um, is this idea of what about the places that don't have a great history, that don't have a lot of trust, you know, built up in the organization? Um, and what, what other opportunity to do that than now, right? It, it's not, well, you know, we couldn't do it before, so we're not going to do it now, or we're concerned about how, what people will think about it. Um, there are some true real opportunities to kind of take advantage of the emotion, the moment, the, the interest um, that is coming out of a lot of people. So Esther, again, would love to come to you around what you're seeing in the chat. I, I can't follow because I'm paying attention to this and there. I just yeah. see comments flowing through there. But I also know you've been talking to CDOs that have said, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what we might want to do. Is this bold enough? Yeah, in the chat, we're still on the allyship. And I would love to hear from everybody. What are some of the actions that your companies actually took when it comes to chief diversity officers? Um, I loved a quote from one amazing CDO around, we need to stop storytelling and actually drive for systemic change. Um, and even the, the language is changing from rethinking um, the talent management systems to 
changing them to disrupting them to removing those that didn't work and introducing new ones so when it comes to hiring processes when it comes to promotions um, a lot of chief diversity officers are putting their energy towards what is the 20 percent of change in the systems that we can make that will drive for the most amount of impact I'm yeah. curious to your point, Esther. I was just going to say, I, I would encourage people in the chat, even if they're not things that your organization has already started to do, um, we promise we're not going to hold you accountable to it yet, but what are things that you've been thinking about, talking about, interested in that truly fit this criteria of acting boldly? David, what were you going to say? Yeah, the same thing. Put in your inspiring ideas. This is the time to share ideas. If there's something you think your organization should do, put it in the chat now. If there's something you think 1,700 other organizations should consider, put it in the chat now because there's 1,700 other organizations here, <laughs> roughly speaking. Um, so, you know, what do you think are the bold actions that your company should do if they're not doing it now? You know, what do you think um, should really happen? And, and David, uh, maybe while folks are, are filling that in, maybe if you could transition to priorities, habits, and systems a bit, because I found also as I've been working with organizations, that's just been an incredible, incredibly useful tool for people to understand maybe where we've gotten stuck in the past or where we are right now and, and what we need to do differently. Yeah, I'll just give, give people a moment because we'll go down a rabbit hole. Uh, just give people a second to kind of put some stuff in the chat and see what's there, but then I think we'll dig into it. I mean, it's everyone's kind of curious, what, what should we do that's really bold? Um, and, and how do we really do it? Um, and, and it's got to be beyond just, you know, putting some money to something, although that can, you know, definitely help. Um, but I think, you know, it's great to see people's bold strategies coming in. Let's, let's jump to PHS. So I'm going to, um, actually, firstly, let me just say, this is the bold thing that we decided to do so far. We're doing some other things. Uh, but at NLI, we've decided to um, give free de-escalation training to um, any and all state and federal law enforcement agencies. And we're going to reach out to them all and offer it and um, make this available uh, for the rest of 2020, maybe longer, I don't know, but for this year, for sure. Um, we're going to actively um, share this out. So this is something that's been really uh, important to us. Um, we had to think about it a lot. And we decided to invest in it and, uh, and really do this. So uh, if you're from a federal agency um, involved in law enforcement, feel free to put your name in the chat right now, just in the chat, put uh, uh, free de-escalation training, but we're, we're providing it to um, uh, specifically to law enforcement. But if you're from law enforcement, put in the chat something now and someone will follow up. Um, but we're gonna follow up with everyone that we can find uh, in that space as well. So that's something that we're doing right now. Let's talk about PHS that, um, that, uh, that, that Khalil's mentioning. Um, and Khalil, I mean, should we move off bold and sort of get into that and the science or what do you think? Yeah, I think, it, I, I think it's worthwhile to, to talk about this because I think what I, what I see from a lot of different people and you know, there's a, a quote that my father used to say before that I think kind of exemplifies some of this moment that, um, you know, uh, Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare, right? And so I think a lot of organizations are trying to figure out what is the action that we want to take? How does it fit together? Um, and so we do need to slow down just a little bit to make sure that we get it right, but not to miss the moment, right? And so that's what I'm seeing a bit in the chat is that people are saying, well, we want to act boldly, but we want a little bit of data. We're not quite sure how to get there. And what I would just encourage us to do is to say, it doesn't need to be perfect. You know, Esther brought up something we've talked about before in terms of kind of the, the clumsy conversations. I think you're point around expectation matching is spot on. Don't say we're going to, you know, completely alter everything we do and then say, oh, never mind. We decided to stop, you know, reviewing resumes the way we were before. But some of that bold action is going to have to take a different way of viewing and a different way of looking at things. Um, so yeah. that's, I think, why we're seeing a, a bit less activity around like, here's what we're doing, because we're not quite sure yet. No one's sure what to yeah. do that's bold. But I mean, here's the framework. Listen deeply, unite widely, act boldly right? Listen, unite, act. The act boldly is really important. Everyone's still working out what that is. That's what I'm getting. People are still trying to, you know, work this out. And, you know, I want to um, actually just put a big shout out for follow the science. You're going to see these words a few times from us. So on screen here is uh, an article you can, uh, maybe one of my team will put in the chat so you can pull it up. But this is an article basically showing that it's possible to run diversity programs that actually make bias worse. And yes, you heard that correctly. 
Uh, all you have to do pretty much is make it mandatory. And there's a greater than 50% chance it'll make people more biased. Um, so, so I just want to, you know, while we want to leverage this moment, absolutely. I just want to make a shout out for also follow the science and be like really thorough. Um, because you literally can increase bias uh, from a series of studies. And this, this article will, uh, will explain that more. So my team will put that in the chat. It's there already. So just, you know, follow the science at the highest level. The science is really three kinds of work that you have to do. You have to make something a priority, which tells the brain to care, you know, focus on this, notice opportunities. The hard work is the habit building. And the reason the hard work is, uh, the reason habit building is hard work is, we don't respect the way habits work and we don't invest in finding out what the really best habits are as a society generally. Um, and we try to go at everything. Um, so sort of two challenges with habits. We just don't, you know, we don't work out which ones really matter, you know, which ones really have an impact from science enough. Um, and then we don't follow, you know, the, the science of how you build them. Um, those are, you know, those are things that we really are, are built for. That's our world. Uh, we're in the habit activation business at scale. Um, so we're constantly evolving and thinking and studying and following the science on what are the right habits. And I don't think there is one set of habits for, um, you know, increasing, uh, you know, creating a more diverse and inclusive organization where people feel fully heard. And I don't, there's not one small set of habits. There's, there is work around um, actively mitigating bias and, um, there's, there's work that really weaves that into the organization's um, language. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, we're talking with a major airline like the, the, you know, every talent meeting, they read out the categories of bias beforehand so that they're primed, just like a safety meeting, right? You know, when we're having a talent review, here are the biases we've got to actually be aware of. Um, so there's, there's language around bias, there's language around inclusion, uh, which is very much SCARF. It's also language around allyship. Some of that anchors on SCARF and some other things. Um, there's also language around uh, employee voice. How do you give people the space to speak up and en encourage that? So I think there's a kind of a few sets of habits um, and there's kind of an ideal order in which to embed these. And then there's a way in which people actually develop habits. So, uh, you know, a big shout out for follow the science. Um, we did decide literally yesterday, I think, um, to schedule something next week exactly on this. I think Khalil, you're running this, is that right? I am. Um, so next Thursday, we are gonna dig into what is the science of creating real change. What you see on screen are the eight research papers we've published over the last um, eight years or so on the deeper science of creating um, more diverse inclusive organizations. So, you know, eight individual research papers that all have a lot in them. So. Next Thursday, do you want to speak a little bit to this, Khalil, sort of what you're going to walk through next week? Yeah, I mean, to your point, we decided yesterday, so we're still going to keep kind of asking people what it is that they'd like to cover. But at the end of the day, you know, what we've talked about here is a framework and a better understanding of the, the steps that leaders and all of us as leaders need to take. We also want to get to the really specific things that people should be doing. What does the science tell us around bias mitigation? What does the science tell us around inclusion? What is, to your point, around these eight papers that we've, you know, researched and written and really dug into? What are the key themes through there? And also, we know that this conversation is continuing to evolve. We know that people are, you know, kind of raising the things they want to do in their organizations and what they're focused on. And so we're going to continue to stay with this conversation for quite some time. And, you know, Esther obviously has been having lots of these discussions and will continue to. Um, she was otherwise booked for this time next week, um, but she will be live and, you know, appearing in a lot of these conversations as we continue to work with so many organizations. Because again, the thing that I keep seeing in the chat is, wow, SCARF has been tremendously helpful for our organization or your work around bias mitigation. I've shared it with my teams and, you know, we do find it to be disruptive language. And so we want to continue to share that. We know that we've got um, real value that we can put out into the, the world. And so um, we're going to do that in this webinar and many, many after. And just a, just a shout out, like if someone in your organization says, we're going to uh, roll out mandatory bias training as soon as humanly possible, please call us. <laughs> um, Please call us. We're going to talk you down from that. Uh, we're going to show you data of just how incredibly effective non-mandatory bias training can be um, if it's done right. Um, and, um, and, and just you know, like show you the research. We've, like, this is a space we've been in for about six or seven years. Um, helped, I think, 150 companies you know, actually 
truly mitigate bias um, with nearly every employee every week. So just be really careful of the knee jerk reaction of, oh, let's go and do unconscious bias training. There are a lot of unconscious bias training initiatives that will actually make things worse. I right. really want you to follow the science. Come to the session next week. Um, also, if you just, uh, you know, just email anyone that you've had contact with us, we're happy to, to share out um, lots of the articles and, and, uh, and, and, and research that we've done on this space. Um, if you know that your, you know, company is like barreling towards that, just reach out. Someone will, um, someone will, uh, you know, walk you through a better way to think about it and what the science really says. Um, on that note, um, something that we're doing, um, just check the timing. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, something that we're doing, we've been doing this for the last month or so. We'll probably continue it for the next few weeks. Uh, we've been offering organizations um, an opportunity basically to pick our brains for um, an hour. And if you want to focus that on DNI and kind of how do we really build the, 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 the learning strategy to truly drive DNI, then we can help you with that as well. But we've been doing these learning strategy audits around kind of how you think you're going to transition to a more virtual learning world and then what the science actually says and how to do it properly. Uh, the reality with going to more virtual learning is actually it can make things a lot better or a lot worse. Uh, we believe we know how to make it a lot better because we've been doing that for a long time. So just put learning strategy order in the chat. If you're from an organization and you think you can gather some of your senior folks in learning, someone will reach out, see if there's a fit and, uh, and set that up with you for the next few weeks. So it can be on broader learning strategy, what you're trying to do with leadership development, or it can be on DNI in particular, but we're doing these learning strategy orders. It's an hour with our senior team to basically help you make this transition. So just throw that in the chat now, if you're interested in that. Um, let me just make a point to this. This is hard data from one company, a, 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 a workshop and a completely virtual solution. Um, what you see here is the workshop 68% uh, of people now consider all evidence before making decisions. 82% in a virtual solution, right? 59 versus 80% uh, believe they're now um, successfully mitigating bias in decisions, right? So actually the fact that workshops are going away is fantastic news for you because we know how to do that kind of work a lot better. Um, Khalil, it, closing comments, um, you know, maybe I'll pull the framework back up. Any closing comments as we kind of bring this together about what to do in this moment, leadership in this moment. Some thoughtful comments before we, and Esther from you as well, before we close off. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know we're coming to the top of the hour and folks, if they're anything like our calendars are, are back to back. Um, the article is out there, the materials are out there, the webinars are out there, but this is the model. This is what you can do in this moment. This is what all leaders should be doing and focusing on and what you wind up doing within your organization may be slightly different in terms of those drop downs, but do these things, do them in these steps and let us know how we can support. Esther, what would you say? And then we'll give it back to you, Gabe. I would just add to that and seeing a lot of comments, I'm not a chief diversity officer, so what do I do? What I'm seeing is that leaders are very, very open to suggestions, ideas, and you had so many ideas and acting boldly. So bring them to your organizations, plug us in if we can help, go to your employee resource groups, but we need to all collectively drive for impact. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanna finish with, um, it's scary. It's scary for everyone. Um, it's, it's an incredibly challenging moment. Um, I've had, you know, incredibly strong threat responses myself all week. It's been intense. Um, but I think this is the right thing to do. I think it's time to listen deeply, to unite widely and to act boldly. Um, and uh, the more we do that together, um, the better off we'll all be. So thanks everyone um, for your partnership and on, my, on our team pulling this together, Esther and Khalil. Thanks everyone for being here and please reach out if there's anything we can, uh, we can help folks with. And don't Thanks go anywhere yet. Gabe's always got good kind of finales and wrap up. So Gabe's stick with us for a couple more minutes. For you. Gabe, back, uh, back to you, Gabe. Thanks David, Khalil and Esther for today's session and the team in the background, as David mentioned, that makes all this seamless. Uh, I hope uh, everyone on the line has found insights and value from today's conversation. And you found some fresh perspectives and principles on how we can lead through these turbulent times. We have one quick poll, uh, a simple one that we'd like to ask you so we know how to best support you. Um, we'd just like to ask if you're from an organization, would you like to speak to an NLI client advisor about your DNI initiatives? Uh, we run webinars, C-suite briefings, a number of the things David mentioned, learning audits, behavior change, learning solutions, 
uh, consulting options to help your organization through this. So, um, yep, yes or no question there. Um, and I'll just leave this running for a bit um, while I mention a couple of other opportunities. Um, we just want to thank you for attending, bringing your insights to light um, in the chat, both on Zoom and LinkedIn Live. As we expected, the chat was very active and we heard some pretty amazing perspectives from all of you. And since we love hearing from you, we'd also love uh, your feedback. If you'd be willing, we'd love to hear what you thought of today's webinars or the one minute survey. Um, Anna Vargas and Mary Grace Rapola should be sharing something in the chat there. Um, again, should take about a minute for you to complete. Um, a couple of other reminders before we let you go. And if you need to drop, of course, please do so at your leisure. For those remaining, if you'd like to watch this webinar again or share it with your colleagues, a recording will be made available by end of business today. Again, that comes from Mary Grace Rapola. Um, and you can respond to her directly in that email if you'd like to explore deeper conversations with client advisors. Uh, regarding what David and Khalil mentioned uh, earlier, if you'd like to dig deeper into how leaders can drive real change in DNI uh, that's supported by science, you can register for this public webinar on Thursday at noon Eastern. There should be a link popping up in your chat there where you can register now. Also, this uh, Friday series that we run regularly, Your Brain at Work Live, uh, will continue next Friday. So be sure to keep an eye out for some upcoming episodes. Uh, we should have another link also coming up in the chat. Um, we'll be joined next week by two CHROs, uh, one from Procter & Gamble and the other from Zoom. And yes, it's that Zoom, the people that are owning the platform that we're broadcasting from now. Uh, so you should be seeing a link coming through there. Um, and lastly, you can hear from these Friday webinars on demand um, by subscribing to our podcast. As you know, uh, these, um, these webinars turn into podcast episodes. So you can listen to those on the platform of your choice. Otherwise, this concludes our formal presentation for today. For those of you who are engaged in conversation in the chat, we're gonna leave the platform open for a few minutes so you can exchange contact information and wrap up your conversations. On behalf of the NLI team and our panelists today, we offer solidarity and wish you safety in however you decide to show up in the unrest we're all experiencing. And we hope to see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye everyone.